It makes sense when you think about it. The quiet kids, the queer kids, the nerds and the geeks and the loners. When everyone else is out there at bars and clubs until two in the morning, sloppy drunk and shoving their tongues against each other's uvulas in front of God and his brother. Where are they supposed to go? All the calm, hushed corners of the world are inaccessible after around eight o'clock. No cafes to tuck into to sip something sweet while clacking away at a keyboard. No bookstores with their worn, welcoming armchairs looking to beckon in the weary. No libraries. Except Matt's. Matt Nelson, my boss, is the director of the night library, for lack of a better term. Does he possess the credentials to occupy the position of a library director? Hmm. Let's just say, if tearing through a pack of cigarettes and a pot of coffee in an hour were the top qualifiers, there'd be no better man for the job. But the night library doesn't have a board of trustees to answer to, which means Matt's GED may as well be a master's. It isn't a public establishment. Nobody's paying for its existence with their tax dollars, and the books don't come straight off the press from the publishing house, ink still wet, pages still hot. I like to think of it as the half-priced books of the library world. Our collection is made up of any and everything anyone is willing to contribute, which leaves us with a total sitting somewhere around a cool thousand items. It's a good thing too, because we wouldn't have enough of a staff to manage it all otherwise. In all, there are seven of us. Or eight, if you count Doug, but no one's entirely sure he exists. Alice is our cataloger, and Matt's very first employee. When he set out to open the night library's doors, he knew he would need a way to keep track of his inventory and he only trusted himself to do so, with the number of books he could count on both hands. The way he tells it, Alice laughed in his face when he propositioned her. She was working the streets at the time, and when he pulled up to her corner in his 97 Ford Ranger, cranking the window down at a geriatric snail's pace to ask if she was interested in alternative employment, she told him whatever he was paying in a week, couldn't hold a candle to what she made in an evening. He handed her his card, which was actually the business card for a local nail salon, covered in whiteout and scribbled over with a sharpie marker, and told her to give him a call if she changed her mind. To this day, she won't tell him why, but when his phone rang smack in the middle of the night, less than a week later, it was Alice on the upper end. What in God's green hell would anybody want with a library open dusk to dawn? She asked him, once he'd elaborated on the position he was offering. Just let me know, he told her. She was outside the door, twenty minutes later. After Alice came Della. She wandered inside one night in the dead of winter, fingertips purple and eyelashes weighed down with ice. Matt was mopping melted snow out of the entryway, and she stopped in front of him, blocking his path. Can I help you? He asked. No response. He took a moment to size her up, gauging the situation, and tried again. Are you looking for work? She snatched the mop straight out of his hand. She's never spoken a word to any of us, but... Not a speck of dust falls on a single surface before she catches it mid-air. We aren't sure if Della is even really her name. Matt just caught her writing it on the bathroom wall with foam cleaner one night, and when he asked her, there was no objection. Horace was next. He'd been a regular patron of the library for quite some time before Matt took notice of the way he meticulously studied the shelves halting any time he spotted a misplaced item to correct it before moving on. Matt stopped him as he was straightening a row of outdated medical texts, and said if he was going to volunteer his time, 
he might as well get paid. Jenny followed not too long after, and she was certainly the most forthright of the crew. She marched directly up to the desk just before closing time and said to Matt, Don't you have a life outside of this place? Matt says now that he supposes he should have taken offence, but seeing as he did in fact not have a life outside of the library, he didn't. No, he told her plainly. Why? Because. Apparently, Jenny popped her gum here, which invited Matt to consider banning gum from the premises entirely. Then, he thought, given that he'd never banned anything from the premises, gum seemed like the wrong place to start. You're here, like, every night. Don't you want some time off? I could run the desk for you. Doesn't look very hard. Okay, Matt said. He gave her a crash course of the circulation system, which isn't a real circulation system at all. One of his tech acquaintances built the program, and it runs exactly as well as we need it to, with no room to spare. It tossed her the keys and headed home. Wiley would be the token charity case, except that they bust their ass harder than the rest of us put together for this place. The first couple of times they came around, they covered one of their eyes with their bangs and hung out in the library's dismal excuse for a teen area from sundown to sun up, never lingering quite long enough to be told that they had to leave before Matt locked up, but certainly cutting it close. While Matt was standing on a ladder one night, trying to stuff enough paper towels around a faulty sprinkler head to keep it from saturating a ceiling tile, Wiley nearly scared him to his death, coming up behind him without a sound. I want to make a deal with you, they said. Once Matt had recovered from his miniature heart attack and regained his balance, he peered down the ladder to find Wiley staring up at him, face fully bared to him for the first time. Right eye bloodshot and swollen with a bruise so dark, it resembled a pit just beginning to yellow around the edges. All right, he agreed, not bothering to ask what the deal might entail. As it turned out, Wiley's bargain was this. Anonymity in exchange for labour. No one can know where I am, Wiley explained. I can't give you my legal name, or an ID, nor my social. But I'll work hard and I'll do it for free if I can stay here. I won't run up the water or the electric. I won't turn any lights on or even use the bathroom during the day. It'll be like the building is empty the whole time it's closed. I swear. I just need somewhere to lock myself in. Matt's only conditions were that Wiley A. Accept a paycheck and B. Keep their arrangement quiet as he didn't need everyone in a rough spot to come into him expecting that they could strike the same deal. Now I have no one to tell, Wiley said, and then asked where Matt kept his tools. If we've ever had a leak since, or a blown bulb, or a fried computer monitor, it hasn't lasted long enough for Matt to call a repairman before Wiley's had it fixed. As for me, it was sort of a fluke that I was hired at all. I don't sleep much during the night. In fact, I've only ever had one day shift job, and my body's internal alarm clock wasn't a fan of that agreement. I was working overnights at a nursing home before the library, and I happened to pass by on a night off after a walk, too antsy to sit alone in my apartment. I'd never noticed it before, which isn't unusual for me as I pride myself in my attention span's ability to give goldfish a run for their money. But the dim glow emanating from inside among the sea of darkened storefronts stood out like a beacon. My first impression based on the interior of the building was that it had likely been a laundromat in a past life, with its poultry concrete floors and low-tiled ceilings. The short, sparse shelves lined along the entryway, 
for new books and special displays I now know, led me in a natural progression to the circulation desk, where Matt had his face buried in his hands and Jenny was holding open a book next to him that had cracked fully down the spine. Loose pages lying haphazardly across the countertop. Can't. Can't afford to replace shit all the time. Matt was saying, muffled by his palms. Whatever. If it's too bad to glue it, just... I don't know. Throw it away, I guess. I'm not sure what possessed me to do so, but... I took a step forward, fingering the edge of the front cover. I can fix it. I said, and then, as though such a vague explanation would make the situation less awkward somehow, I do that, fix books. Matt's head raised slowly, as though someone had attached it to a string. Got a whole tower in the back, can you fix all of them? I mean, I'd have to look at them first, I told him. I've never done it on, like like a professional level, but my grandpa had some book presses he left me when I was in high school, so I've been doing it as a hobby for ten years, give or take. Matt seemed to mull this over for a moment. Most of what we've got, not anything special, but there are a couple of collector's items here and there, signed copies, first editions, stuff like that. We can't find them down near anywhere, and if you do, People want a pretty penny for them. What's your name? Adam. Matt stuck his hand across the desk. Welcome aboard, Adam. When can you start? That was three years ago, which doesn't sound like a ton of time, granted, but there are some things around here you have to get used to so quick that by three months in, you start to feel like a seasoned vet. Every place has its odd little ins and outs, of course. We've got plenty. The back door next to the dumpster sticks from the outside, so we have to prop it open to take the trash out, unless we want to walk around to the front. One of the bathroom lights is finicky. When the switch is flipped, they all shut off but the very centre panel, and it takes a few tries to make it cooperate. Our power gets knocked out so easily in storms that We've got about a metric fuckton of battery-operated fans to keep cool, and a whole manual checkout system for when the computers are down. But, as inconvenient as these little quirks can be at times, they're things we're all more than happy to deal with day to day. Matt's a good boss. He takes care of us, with what little means he has. We don't get benefits, but he pays us for a full week of sick days each fiscal year and we get paid holidays off. If we have something going on that we need to miss for, he never says no. We essentially set our own schedules, and there's no minimum to the number of hours we can work, so long as we're cool with the cut on our checks. The break room stays stocked with generic snacks and off-brand sodas, and as long as we're not tending to a patron, he genuinely couldn't care less whether we're on our phones or listening to music as long as our work is done. We don't have a dress code. No staff meetings. No eight-hour trainings. I mean, I won't be a millionaire anytime soon, but the pay is good. Better than I expected. When Matt told me at the beginning of my interview, which was actually just me filling out paperwork, what the pay rate was, I couldn't help but raise a brow. I don't have a degree, I informed him, in case somehow he'd confuse me with someone whose life was far more put together, or any experience in the field, technically. I know, he said. Just think of it as incentive. I hope it's enough to keep you around. I didn't understand at first what the hell that was supposed to mean. We're in a slightly rougher area of town, so I figured maybe we'd run into the occasional dispute or keyed-up addict. Then I finished my entry packet and flipped it over to find the last paper on the table, simply titled 
Start Rules. It read as follows. 1. If you come across a man named Doug, tell him that of course you recognise him. Furthermore, ask why he's introducing himself, as you've worked together since you were hired. He will laugh and ask your forgiveness for being so forgetful, at which point you should be clear to go about your day. However, if he happens to ask you if you think he's doing alright at his job, be sure to tell him he's doing so well that if he ever left, we could never hire someone else to take his place. 2. There is no pool in the library, not in the basement, which does not exist, nor on the roof. If someone asks you if you've been swimming in the pool yet, do not give a definitive answer. Simply say that you don't like to swim. Important, do not say that you can't swim, just that you don't enjoy it. If you see a pool, exit the building, and do not return until sunset the next evening. You're simply exhausted from working night shifts. 3. Do not bring peanuts or any peanut products into the building. Horace, our page, is allergic. 4. The second floor is only storage. Nothing is moving upstairs. If you think you hear anything unusual, i.e. scratching, stomping, humming, it's either the HVAC system or the pipes. Number 5. All of the keys that you need can be found on the keyring in the drawer below the time clock. If you come across a door that isn't labelled on the cheat sheet for the keys, you don't need to open it. It's likely just maintenance access. Number 6. Staff parking is in the upper lot. Number 7. When working in the children's area, do not be alarmed if books fall off the shelves from time to time. It's nearly imperceptible to the naked eye but several of the shelves are built at a slight angle. Number 8. The coffee pot in the staff kitchen is free for everyone to use, and coffee supplies are located in the cabinet above the microwave. If you pick up the coffee pot and find that it is full of a dark, viscous substance, simply clean it out in the sink before using it. Just plug your nose while doing so. Number 9. We do not have gender-specific restrooms, and any protest in regards to such will not be tolerated. Number 10. If you see an elderly Hispanic woman, dressed in a morning garb, crying quietly with her head down at the table in the back corner next to non-fiction, do not approach her. However, if she makes eye contact with you of her own accord, be sure to offer her your condolences. If she signals for you to come closer, tell her that you're sorry, but you have got to get back to work. If she starts to stand, turn calmly away and begin walking at a brisk but unalarmed pace back towards the front of the building. Do not look behind you. Do not run. Number 11. On the last Saturday of each month, our custodian, Della, uses a specific cleaning solution to mop. The red coloration comes from the active ingredient, which is what protects the floors and keeps them from staining in the event of spills. It is not blood. Number 12. Please do not use Windex on the plexiglass windows of the meeting room. It streaks. Number 13. Keep an analog watch on your person at all times. If you ever feel that too little or too much time has passed since you entered the building, consult it rather than your phone or the clock on the computer. Whatever it says is correct. We look forward to working with you. Welcome to the Night Library. I've had several experiences worth recounting, to say the least. But the first story that comes to mind is in regards to rule number two so I thought I'd share that with you today. I'd been working at the night library for exactly seven days. Four shifts, but it was one week to the day since I'd been hired, and everything was going surprisingly smoothly. 
as any sane person would do, I had put the list of rules out of mind. Gathering that they were nothing more than a tactic to haze new employees. Assuming that I would have a leg up on them if I didn't acknowledge the list at all. I hadn't even mentioned it when I'd finished filling out my entry paperwork. Simply slipped it into my locker and handed the rest to Matt. Now, I was asked about it, of course, several times over the course of the following nights. Various co-workers approached me to inquire as to whether anything had happened to me yet. When I asked what they meant, their response was always some variation of, you know, the rules. And I would just snout and roll my eyes and be on my way. On the evening of my fourth shift, I had stepped away from the little hole in the back office that Matt had set up as a book mending station for me and was briefly helping Jenny out. We were unusually swamped at the desk, and Matt had taken off for the night, so I figured she could use a little extra manpower. We'd worked our way almost entirely through the line, and when the face of the last patron finally surfaced from the crowd, Jenny was still busy with someone else, so, naturally, it was me they looked to. Hi, I said. What can we do for you? That was when I noticed their eyes. There wasn't anything wrong with them. Not technically. They were dark, but not unnaturally so. Not bloodshot. The pupils weren't abnormally large, but there was something behind them that... No, no. Let me try that again. There was nothing behind them. That was the problem. I looked away. Paul, they said. I cleared my throat. Sorry? Paul, your Paul. I need help finding it. I laughed, and a cool air of relief washed over me. They looked soulless and creepy as hell, on purpose. Of course. Matt had put them up to this. Or, if not Matt, one of the other employees. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. I told them. That's not gonna work on me. Nice job, though. You kind of freaked me out for a second. The patron said nothing, just ever so slightly furrowed their brow and tilted their head to the side, as though they didn't understand what I was saying. I need help finding your pool, they repeated. I leaned partway across the counter, lowering my voice so that Jenny couldn't overhear. She seemed preoccupied enough, but you never quite know with her. Look, dude, I don't want to spoil the fun for everyone else, so I'm going to let them think you're pulling one over on me for a while, okay? But I'm not buying it. I'll walk away from the desk with you, but once we're out of the line of sight, you can drop the act. This seemed to satisfy them well enough, because they turned and began heading opposite my direction. I quickly ducked out from behind the counter to follow. We walked in silence until we were safely hidden in the stacks, and then I stopped, reaching out to place a hand on their shoulder. All right, pal, I think we've made it far enough. They faced me, and I waited for the facade to fall away. It didn't. Your pool. They recited once more. Slowly, a quiet unease began to creep up my spine. Um. I managed. Where is it? For a moment, I considered. There was absolutely no way in hell any of this rules bullshit was real. But why were they so dedicated? Is Matt paying you to do this? They stared blankly at me, the same dead eyes as before, unblinking and cold. Where? They demanded icily. Is. Your. Paul. 
as little stock as I had put into the list. It had, in its absurdity, stuck with me in such a way that made it difficult not to recall near to every detail. There is no ball in the library, I remembered reading. And then, not in the basement, which doesn't exist. It's in... the basement? I tried, fearing that the next query would be where the basement was located. But no more questions came. Instead, the patron nodded and left me alone between Stephen King and Leanne Moriarty. I shouldn't have followed them. For countless reasons, I shouldn't have. But I wanted, needed, to know what was going on. So, I peeked around the edge of the shelf, ensuring that I'd given them enough leeway not to take notice of me trailing them. And then I set off. They were headed toward the children's area, which was entirely across the building from where we'd just been, and I was forced to keep my pace brisk so as not to lose sight of them. They bobbed and weaved in and out of my view, but I always managed to catch up just before it was too late. We traversed through the baskets of puzzles and blocks, along the dingy train mat thrown thoughtlessly across the largest expanse of open floor, and somewhat to my right, a read-along book that had been left open was stuck on a loop of animal sounds. We passed by the library's small collection of second-hand leapfrog learning pads and stepped over a spilled bin of well-worn stuffed animals, me keeping as quiet as I could all the while. Finally, we reached the rear wall, and I saw something I'd never noticed before. There was a door. Nothing about it was special or notable in the slightest. It was a metal rectangle that had been painted the same deep, flat shade of blue as the building's exterior doors, and it was fitted with an identical window so high up I would have needed a ladder to see what lay beyond. As was the only logical next event in our sequence, the patron approached it and turned the handle, which opened to them fluidly and without issue. Half of me hoped it would do the same when it was my turn. I half hoped it wouldn't. The door wasn't loud. I wasn't particularly concerned that they'd hear me breach it once it had fallen close behind them. But just to be safe, I counted off ten Mississippis before easing it open and slipping inside. Immediately, I was immersed in darkness. It would have been total had it not been for the dim glow permeating through from the bottom of the set of descending steps before me. My brain, scrambling to compute, insisted that the lack of basement in the building must have been part of the elaborate ploy. The fact that I'd never noticed the door didn't mean it didn't exist. Clearly it did, as I'd just used it. I'd only been here a week. It wasn't like I'd had a chance to explore every cubic inch of the place. Taking a steadying breath, I mentally chastised myself for being so gullible and started down the stairs. It took longer than I felt it should to reach the end. Far longer. But I chalked it up to anticipation and kept on until I reached a level, concrete platform. The only turn to make was a right one, so I took it, drawing steadily closer to the disembodied light source. I travelled down a narrow corridor, minding my step once I realised that the floor was covered in about an eighth of an inch of water, just enough to result in a soft, echoing splash if I swung my foot down with enough force. I didn't hear anything else ahead of me, but the patron hadn't preceded me by much. They had to be fairly close. Soon, the hallway opened into what I understood to be the basement. Beams and pipes littered the ceiling in an impossible maze, and I found that the light I had been following was produced by a single low wattage bulb suspended from the rafters by a wire. I could see the centre of the room clearly, 
but the edges blurred back into shadow. Straight ahead, I thought something shifted, but I couldn't be sure. Considering that I was out in the open now, with nowhere to hide, I called out a reluctant, Hello? No direct response came, but there was a quiet skittering from the same area, where I thought I'd seen motion. So I moved toward it, against my better judgement, squinting an attempt to make out a shape of any form. When I finally settled on one, it was the yawning, black mouth of an entryway. Almost blindly, I felt my way forward, and stuck my hand inside to be met with empty air. The basement was cooler than upstairs already, but as I stepped fully through, I estimated the temperature drop to be another five degrees at the very least. The water that had veiled the floor from the bottom of the stairs had never receded, but it grew a hair deeper here, just enough so that it began lapping at the canvas above the soles of my shoes. Hello? I asked again, too unsure of my surroundings to go any further. I stood my ground and listened intently. This time, I could swear I heard a faint splash. It's difficult to explain what happened next. It was as though a film of a sort lifted from the entirety of the premises. And with it, the darkness. Not like someone had flipped on a switch, more like opening a blackout curtain. That's when I realised that it was because something was emerging from underwater. Before I go into detail about that, let me set the scene for you. As soon as my environment was illuminated, my heart gained sentience and decided there was no time like the present to explore the outside of my chest. I was the origin of freeze being tacked onto the old flight or flight adage, but once I'd thought, I took a liberal, stumbling step backward, so close to the space my toes had just inhabited, that I'd have been done for had I allowed myself so much as a readjustment. There was a pool, or rather, a pit full of water, so dark and deep, it appeared bottomless, Something about it affected my perception of the rest of the space. It was so all-encompassing that everything around it seemed to be pulling toward it as though it was the center of gravity, dizzying and cloying. Thankfully, however, my focus was instantaneously directed elsewhere. Have you ever seen an anglerfish? I assume you have, but if not, take a second to Google it. What had arisen from the depths of the pool, pond, liquid grave, greatly resembled one in several respects. The most notable being the giant, pulsating bulb protruding from the center of its head, and dangling in such a way as to perfectly illuminate the second most notable feature. The teeth. The most prominent difference between the thing before me and a traditional anglerfish was the size. For example, a fully grown anglerfish generally reaches the length of a ruler, but has on rare occasion been known to scarcely outgrow a yardstick. A yardstick may have been a match for a single dagger-like protrusion, jutting like a stalagmite from this creature's jaw. I ran, slipping along the damp floor and barely catching myself on the wall several times before finally finding myself in the stairwell again. I began ascending it with all the force and swiftness in my being. They say the drive home always feels shorter, and this was apparently applicable to the trip up the stairs from the gate to hell versus down the stairs to it as well. 
because it felt as though not a second had passed before I was shoving the door open and collapsing onto the carpeted ground outside to catch my breath. When I got my bearings and stood, glancing quickly over my shoulder to be sure I hadn't inadvertently invited anything to accompany me out of the basement, I felt my stomach plummet. The door was gone. I looked insane by the time I made it back to the desk, and Jenny wasn't shy about telling me so. What happened to you? She asked. Did somebody waterboard you, or is that sweat? I saw it, I told her. The pool. She cocked one brow, eyes minutely widening. Welcome to the club, noob. Get out of here. I'll see you tomorrow. I got out. Needless to say, I started studying that list like gospel the next night, and never questioned it again. It saved my ass a fair few times now, as it has everyone's here. Now before you ask why I don't quit, why any of us just don't quit, I have to admit that I don't have a solid answer for you. The money is definitely a part of it. Matt knows what he's doing, buttering us up, giving us incentive not to seek out alternative employment. He keeps the staff small and cuts corners pretty much anywhere else he can, so he's able to pay us what he does. But there's something else too. Something too intangible to verbalise. And it's unspoken between the lot of us that the sensation is mutual. We're just... supposed to be here. Besides, I don't know if the library would take too kindly to us leaving. Hello, sinister listeners. If you've enjoyed this story, then you'll find all the author's information in the description below. For more content, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to succumb to the sinister.